I'm Mary Berry, and in this series, I'll be celebrating the very best of my everyday cooking. Day-to-day -day cooking needn't be mundane. Even the simplest recipes can be a joy. I want to show you easy ways to transform dishes into something really special. From my indulgent and delicious ideas. It's sheer heaven on a plate. Mm. To my hearty and wholesome delights. Wow, look at that. And some old and new ways to excite the family. Granny's lost her goat. In this program, my everyday recipes that really take me back to my childhood. I think my mum will be looking down and thinking, well, that was quite a good idea. There's nowhere that inspires my cooking more than Scotland. That's because it was the birthplace of my mother. So I think of myself as half Scottish. And for me, the place is filled with delicious memories. I spent many wonderful times up here and I just love this wild and beautiful landscape and the odd drop of rain. My Scots heritage has shaped a lot of my cooking. So in this programme, I want to share some of my best loved and most cooked dishes and show you how to make the most of them. A wonderful classic made with a delicious Highland twist, along with my secret to spruce up glorious veg. A fish supper that adds a bit of zing to an old favourite and a Scots-inspired pud that brings back sweet memories. But first, a trip down memory lane for a cosy dish inspired by my mother. What could be more every day than eggs and bacon? The smell alone as you come in the kitchen of frying bacon just reminds me of my childhood. So I'm going to make something a little bit different with bacon this time, rosti. I'm going to elevate the old bacon and egg combo because in this dish, eggs rest on a delicious bacon rusty. Nowadays, bacon nearly always comes without the rind, but I can remember in childhood, we had the bacon rinds and they were taken off and fried in the pan first and then all the extra fat was used for frying eggs and things. Start by frying the bacon until every bit is deliciously crisp. Gosh, this smells good. That looks so tempting. I could eat it right now, let alone using it for rosti. Pop a thinly sliced onion into the bacon fat. Just add flavour to so many things. I don't know where we'd be without them. I'm going to leave the lid on that so it cooks in its own steam. And I'm going on to do the potatoes. Coarsely grate three floury potatoes. And I'll show you the secret behind a really crisp rosti. Get rid of all that starchy water. So take a tea towel. You can see already it is really, really wet. Take that by all four corners and I'm going to squeeze it so that all the liquid comes out. That's it. Once that's done, add those lovely fried onions and the bacon and season it. I can smell the bacon coming up now. It just is such a lovely memory. Do you know, some of the simplest things are the best and also very inexpensive. A couple of rashers of bacon, potato, onion, and eggs on top. That's it, all done. So I'm using the same frying pan. I'm going to add a little more oil. Then I'm going to tip that in. So there it goes. Now the next thing you have to do is to press it down because it's really a potato cake. 
so there are no gaps, so it all clings together. And because this is freshly grated, the starch is holding it all together. And it's a wonderful dish, which is so simple to make. It just needs a few minutes to cook on a medium heat. The delicious smells really take me back to my childhood. Things were short when um, I was young because uh, it was sort of the end of the war and we kept goats for milk uh, and we had a pig. And uh, we never became attached to the pig. It was very much that we knew that we were going to eat it and we shared it with neighbours. And all the bits and bobs that were left Dad used to make sausages. Well, it was a great treat to have real pork sausages. Once the rosti is crisp and golden, turn it out so you can cook the other side. And what could finish it off better than fried eggs? And now to bring it all together. There you have it. Rosti with fried eggs on the top. That's just the sort of meal that I like when I'm really hungry. So I'm gonna get stuck in. It is absolutely delectable, delicious, wonderful. I'm in for another slice. I adore my bacon and eggs, but my mother's Scottish childhood made her a great fan of all things from the sea. And I'm just the same. I've come right up to Ullapool, a famous fishing port on the northwest coast of Scotland, to meet Kirsty, who gets the pick of the local catch for her seafood shack. Hello, you must be Kirsty. I am. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> All the locals have said the one place to come to is oh, here. Oh, uh, well, thank I'm you right very here. much. I mean, look what you've got. Lobster, scallops. Oh. The one thing that I've no idea what it is, is spiny. What um, is it? So that is a spiny or a squat lobster. They're very, very cheap for us to get in because there's no market for them. They don't actually keep. So it's an everyday thing here for us. Every day for you, but not for me. Oh, yeah, exactly. But if you'd like, I'll show you if you want to come in. Well, I'll bring my new friend and you can tell me all about it. Yeah. I'm always happy to learn a new trick or two about cooking seafood. Kirsty serves these squat lobster like popcorn. How lucky I am to taste. So we would normally have them with a wee bit of garlic mayonnaise and some salt and pepper, and that's all you need. <laughs> Here it goes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Just wait a minute. I haven't got there yet. <laughs> Absolutely delicious. Oh, good. It's so beautiful here. I mean, looking out at those hills. Oh, I know, isn't and it? I bet you can see the boats coming in in you the can, morning. You can, yeah, we can see the boats all coming in in the morning. It's great. And my partner, Josh, is a fisherman, which is great because every morning he'll come in with a whole load of spinies. I'll go down to the pier, see what he's got, and then we'll cook them for that day and they're sold. The reason shellfish are so good up here is because of the clean, cold waters. I'm dying to see what Josh has caught so we can cook some straight from the sea. Josh, is this the catch of the day? It is indeed. I was out this morning, nice and early. These are longestines. So, exactly. We've got real nice condition longestines here, a delicacy on the west coast. And, um, yeah, these are caught with the creels we're seeing up here. Along the bottom, in the mud, this is where these guys like to live, in the burrows. And um, that's it, having a peek. Hey, that's a very hard shell. Absolutely, yeah. Like they're very leather. beautiful. And those are lobsters. Of course, they're, they're alive because they're black. Absolutely, And they yeah. go red as soon as you uh, yeah. cook them. Yeah, so fresh out the water this morning. You're always excited to see a lobster in a Oh, I mean, they're sheer luxury, aren't they? Yeah. I've been looking forward to some Scottish shellfish. How about some langoustine and we'll cook them on the beach? Sounds Perfect. Good. Sounds good to me. <laughs> langoustine are the cream of the crop when it comes to prawns. And after mackerel, these are the most valuable catch in Scotland. I can't wait to sample them. Off we go then. Yeah. <laughs> you lead the way. <laughs> I can think of nowhere else I'd rather be. It's just perfect. 
Now, we're two cooks. Can you be chef for the day? I'll try my very best. Pan fried with butter, garlic, a few fresh herbs. Langoustine a la plancha. Just how I like it. Beautiful. So, Josh, are those done, do you think? I think that's us ready now. Yeah, they, oh. They've got a nice bit of colour across the back. A bit of lemon over the top. Sounds good. Sounds good. Smells oh. delicious. Come on, give me a lesson how I do it. A little twist from side to side, in theory. The tail will come off, and then... And we're just left <laughs> I'll do exactly what you said. Yeah. I bet it doesn't come anywhere near like that. Just grab a hold and uh, wiggle it out. We've got to be patient, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. It'll be worth it in the end. I know. There we are. It's coming. How about that? Cheers. Good. As good as it gets, really, isn't it? Do you know, that's the best thing I've ever had. It's just like lobster. And warm and garlicky, a hint of thyme. It is absolutely amazing. The very best of Scotland. And Thank with you. this amazing background, yeah. a la pool at its best. <laughs> It's not only stunning shellfish that I fell in love with as a child. I also learned how to cook and eat salmon on these beautiful shores. And my next recipe is a new and delicious way to serve it. When I was young, salmon was very much a luxury. In fact, you couldn't buy the cuts of salmon, you had to buy the whole salmon. And it was for a very special celebration. I'm going to show you a very special way of doing it. Um, it's piquant, it's different, and it's healthy. This is a light, simple dish served on a bed of tender leeks, which I'm going to soften in butter. While that's going, I'm going to make the dressing. And the dressing is made of yuzu. Now, you may not have come across it before. I haven't used it a lot, but I do like it. It's Japanese, and it is a fruit, it's sometimes yellow, sometimes green, and it has a very citrusy uh, flavour. Start with a couple of tablespoons of the yuzu juice. If you can't find any, then a mix of lemon and lime juice will do the trick nicely. A finely chopped red chilli to give it a kick. A couple of cloves of garlic. And I'm going to just grate those. You could use a, a garlic press if you prefer. So just rub that down. And some fresh ginger. So all these flavours when I was young weren't about, weren't available. The only thing that I can remember was using powdered ginger. And finally, four tablespoons of olive oil and give it a good stir. It already looks good. It looks exciting. Now, I'm going to put some on top of the salmon and some I'm keeping as a dressing. And I'm going to measure off two tablespoons. One, two. All the rest will go on top of the salmon in a moment. Once the leeks are soft, season with a little pepper and salt and layer them into an oven-proof dish. Now, it's something that not many people serve leeks with salmon, but I think it goes really well. Now for the salmon, and I like to use the middle cut, which is the thickest and most succulent part of the fish. Because I've seasoned the leeks really well, I'm not going to season the underside of the salmon. So I'm going to put that on top, and they fit very neatly into the dish. Leave space either side. Just a bit more salt, and pour on that wonderful zingy dressing about a spoonful over the top. The secret with salmon is not to overcook it. So into the oven at 180 fan for 12 to 15 minutes, but keep an eye. Well, that certainly looks good. For a bit of Asian flair, Garnish with delicately sliced radishes tossed in the reserved dressing. Scrumptious. Isn't that a lovely idea to give a real lift to an everyday classic salmon? From beautiful salmon to another of Scotland's favourites.
The sight of a wild highland stag is always a thrill. And these regal animals are prized for their wonderful lean meat. This is real venison country, isn't it? I mean, you can just feel it in the air, can't you? I've come to meet one of Scotland's most talented chefs, Tom Kitchen, who's simply wild about venison. There's such a demand for it. Everybody's enjoying it more, and it's lean, it's healthy, yeah. it's good for us. And it, I mean, after all, it's just like cooking beef, isn't it? Exactly. And he's promised me a rather special open-air lunch. What about that? Look at that barbecue, Mary. What a setting. What a setting, what a location. And this is the venison. Yeah, look at this. They've got the lovely loin of venison. And this is interesting. This is a T-bone of venison. And in Scotland, we're really showcasing in the farmer's markets and the butchers, like, all the different cuts that you can get. Because, of course, it's just like any other. It's just like beef. It's got four can... legs. It's got four legs, exactly. So we're going to just really barbecue those really quickly on that hot barbecue. So that'll and be very, very tender. The, it the, should the, be the, delicious, the... yeah. So if you could clean the mushrooms for me, Mary, that would be amazing. And I'll do the chopping of the... Uh... The red cabbage. Yeah, because red cabbage, traditionally, we always serve it with venison here in Scotland. But not many people know that it's really lovely raw. Yes. And in a salad as well. I think you've done that before. So while I sort a simple dressing, Tom is rustling up a wonderful Highland coleslaw to complement the venison. Red cabbage, walnut and that. Skin and all. Skin and all. OK, so you want to pour some of that over the salad. Do you know what I was going to do? I would do it the other way round so the bowl's clean. Come You're on. the boss. Thank you. Right, it's going in. It's very colourful. And then these as well, absolutely delicious. What we call them up here, brambles. Brambles, What do you that. English call them? Oh, well, they call them blackberries, but I call them brambles yeah. because I come from the, Scottish the, stock. The best bit of you is Scottish, no? no? I don't know about that. But... <laughs> if you want to just pick a few leaves of parsley. And to finish it off, pan-fried chirol, straight from the forest floor. There we go. Oh, look at that. It's like a marriage of flavours, a real Scotland on a plate, isn't it? Lovely. Are we on to the venison? Right, on to the venison. Tom has marinated these steaks with fresh rosemary and thyme. When I do steak, I always season with pepper and salt. Yeah. As long as you do it just before you put it on, exactly. otherwise it draws the blood exactly. out, doesn't it? It's one thing I really agree with you chefs, that I do like my food well seasoned, because you cannot correct it at the table, because it doesn't go in in the same yeah. way. Woohoo! Oh, yes. Lovely. How's the salad, OK? The salad looks wonderfully colourful. Oh, look at that. Lovely. That looks beautiful. Is that one? So tender. Mm. I love it. OK. okay. Yep. If you finish that up, Mary, I've just got to nip and get something. I'll be back in a minute. OK. There we have it. Marinated venison steak with a Highland red cabbage slaw. Perfect. One for her lady. Oh, I'm away. <laughs> Ma'am. Thank you. Welcome home, Mary. I'm here to stay. <laughs> you don't have to be a deer stalker to enjoy venison. It's easy to pick it up in supermarkets and a perfect addition to transform a favourite family classic. And what better to go with it than stir-fried veg with shallots and garlic? Nothing's more every day than cottage pie. We all love it. My mother used to make it with what she called Scotch mince, which was simply minced beef, carrot and onion. But I'm going to do a different variation today. Instead of the beef, I'm going to use venison. The secret behind a perfect cottage pie is to layer the flavours, starting with some crispy bacon. And the fat is full of flavour that's left in the pan. And then cook the vegetables in the bacon fat, starting with a finely chopped onion and some fresh rosemary. Then in goes the carrot. And finally, a heaped tablespoonful of flour, which will give the sauce a velvety consistency. Now to the star of the show. 600 grams of minced venison. It's 
funny that in early days, venison was not popular in Scotland. They used to roast a haunch of venison, but very rarely was it used for something like cottage pie, and I think it makes an excellent cottage pie. For even more depth of flavour, I love to add a really good glug of red wine. And that'll be left for supper. And finally, 600 ml of beef or game stock. So that has simmered gently for 40 minutes. I'd better just see that it's done, just a sec. I know it's very hot. That's beautifully soft. Mm, it's a good flavour. Ladle the mince into a shallow dish and leave it to cool. What cottage pie is complete without a delicious topping of mashed potato? At home, I always just do mashed potato on top with a little bit of milk and butter. But my mum always used to use a thing called a ricer. And I still got it. And I'm really rather pleased. It must be over 100 years old. And I have memories of mum doing this. God, it's really heavy. And it's a, a brilliant machine. Let me just show you how it works. So you take some potato. In it goes like that. And then into the pan, watch it come through. Doesn't it come through beautifully? Uh, it actually looks, when you get close up, looks just like rice, boiled rice. I think that's why it's called a ricer. You know, Mum was cooking right till the end of her life, and she died at 105, and I expect she's looking down now and thinking, very good idea to use venison. I like a rich potato topping, so in goes butter. Just to make it a nice spreading consistency. A splash of milk. And in no way would my mum put cream in there. That wasn't for those sort of occasions. And seasoning. A really good tip is to let the mince go stone cold before you add the mash. If you do it when it's hot, it will just mix in with the mince. Then it's into the oven at 180 fan until it's golden and bubbly. I can't wait. While that's in the oven, I can show you how to turn a bowl of ordinary veg into something exciting. The secret of everyday cooking is to shake it up a bit, make it a bit different. I'm giving plain old broccoli and cauliflower a real lift. Banana shallots will give the veg a lovely flavour. If you haven't any shallots, you could use finely chopped or sliced onion and then give that a good stir and keep it going for a few minutes. Once they're soft and translucent, in go the veg. So what I'm going to do is give this a quick stir, like that. I have to admit that when I was young, some of our vegetables were a bit overcooked, and now I love them with a bone in the middle. In goes the garlic. Add crushed garlic near the end so it doesn't burn along with a good tablespoon of runny honey. So tempting. Sorry, it's irresistible. Just one small piece. That is absolutely scrumptious. Stir frying really gives an added dimension to everyday veg. And there you have it the perfect accompaniment to my venison cottage pie. I don't think anybody will notice if I have a little try, just in the interest of science. Oh, it's hot. Mmm. There's a lovely crunchiness to that potato and a very full flavour to the venison. Do you know, I think having venison instead of beef really gives it a lift and makes it a very special pie. We were never without a bottle of whiskey in the drinks cupboard when I was growing up. And as the weather draws in, a wee dram in my sumptuous pud seems a jolly good idea. 
So I'm going to be making Scots whiskey cream. And here's the main ingredient. The clouds are coming down, so I've got to be quick, otherwise I might be masked with the crowd. The joy of this recipe is a potent syrup, starting with the juice of half an orange and the all-important whiskey. Whenever I see whiskey, I always think of my grandfather. He was a Scot, and he used to come and stay when I was a little wee girl. And he used to have a dram at six o'clock. And believe it or not, come sort of bedtime, another dram, and the drams got increased. To that, I just add 100 grams of caster sugar and three tablespoons of lovely Dundee marmalade. That's it. And the little bits of peel go in there too. Now, this is going to make a syrup, and so I'm camping. I've got to turn that on, press that hard. Can you hear it? I can. It's away. So put this on and dissolve the sugar. Drop in some pieces of orange peel to infuse. All that will add to the flavour. The trick for a thick, dreamy syrup is to let it come to the boil for a minute. And don't be tempted to stir. If you do, the sugar will crystallise. The smell is amazing. There we go. So leave that to get stone cold, leaving those big strips of peel in there. Once it's cool, I can bring it all together. Remove the peel and add 450 ml of pouring double cream. Oh, wonderful everyday Scottish ingredients. Then whisk to a thick foam. No electric mixer out here, just a hand one. Surprisingly, it's going very quickly. Aren't I lucky? I think there might be thunder coming or something. They always say that when there's thunder, it thickens more quickly. This is so deliciously potent, I'd like to serve it in shot glasses. And finish with a little sort of swirl as you do it. Topped off with another Scottish favourite. These are simply beautiful. There's three of those on top of each one. And lastly, some orange zest. It just sort of finishes it off. At this stage, I don't half need warming up, so let me try. And I might even have a dram afterwards. I can tell you, it's well worth the drizzle, the wind, and the chilling to make this. It is fantastic. Next time, it's hearty and wholesome recipes for when you've really worked up an appetite. That is blissful. It is scrumptious. It's beautiful.